and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about times where the scriptures have become real to us or more meaningful or had power in our lives because we think as they become more real, we can draw more power from them and we need that power. I'm your host, Carrie Mielstein, and I have two guests with me today. This is just a delightful opportunity and privilege. Um, we have Sean and Arden Hopkin with us. Uh, I've known Sean for a very long time. He's currently my department chair, but I, I like him anyway. And um, he is, uh, we've just been colleagues for a very long time, even uh, when uh, Sean was uh, just finishing graduate school and I was a fairly new faculty member. And then I got to know Arden when uh, I was teaching in uh, at the BYU Jerusalem Center. And uh, I knew him then as Elder Hopkin with his wife, Sister Hopkin. And they were up in the Galilee area uh, we went and uh, stayed and spent some time with them and found them the most wonderful, kind, loving host, but also uh, he is incredibly musically talented. So welcome to the show, Hopkin. Uh, I wouldn't say brothers, I guess uh, it's the Hopkin family. We are brothers Hopkin, but we share go. other relationships as well. That's I'm right. proud to say my son is your department chair. Yeah, yeah, you should be proud. So maybe we'll call you Hopkin and Hopkin. That sounds like a, a good business. H and H Incorporated. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and I have to say before we say anything more, uh, Carrie was really instrumental. Honestly, as I was preparing to get hired at BYU, a mentor. I had submitted a paper, and and there was a discussion of you know uh, some things in the paper, and he said, "Okay, let's work through this because I I want this to be as good as possible," and so. <laughs> He's played uh, from early on an important role in my career. And Carrie, I remember that well. We, we haven't talked about that much, but I remember that well. I just did a lunch one time, I think, but I, I remember it well as well, because anyway, there was some silly stuff with it, but uh, not on your part, but others. <laughs> you were so good to work with. Uh, I've never uh, regretted uh, having had that opportunity to work with you or the hundred others that have come. Well, yeah. please tell us a little bit about yourselves. Why don't you start, Sean? All right. Well, so I've been at BYU since 2011. We've already referred to that a little bit. Um, uh, I'm in the Department of Ancient Scripture with Carrie. Um, I my uh, academic background. I did a, a bachelor's and a master's here at BYU in Ancient Near Eastern Studies, and then Hebrew Studies at the University of Texas in Austin. While I was I was working for seminaries and institutes at the time, and uh, so I taught seminary and provo and. Uh, Provo High and Tempe High, and then off to Austin Institute. We love, loved being down there in Texas and in Austin. I grew up with my family. My as a child, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, and so it was fun to be back in Austin. And then here in Provo since 2011, and have just loved being here. And um, Bible, Hebrew Bible, Psalms, Isaiah. Those are some spaces that uh, both Carrie and I love to explore and and understand better and and it's it's a delight to teach them as well so that that's just a little bit about me wonderful and and uh, i'll save my texas jokes for later <laughs> so. in my case i was um i aspired to be a professional singer started out got my bachelor's degree at byu and um, began to perform both in musical theater and in the opera uh, i went on to my master's degree in the university of north texas uh, started to pick up some other uh, performing opportunities in that area and went on for my PhD at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, always with the anticipation that I was going to be a professional singer. Uh, just short of my 30th birthday, I, I re remember this moment very well. I realized that I was married with four children and I was preparing to move to New York City the next year with no prospect of making a living. And that was a really tough moment. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm good enough to be a journeyman singer, but not good enough to be world famous. And it's going to take me a while. And how am I going to support my family? So regretfully, I changed my career goals and went uh, toward education. Was fortunate to have landed a position at Texas Christian University, moved there and began my teaching career, but not really well prepared as a teacher. I was prepared as a singer. Um, and it's taken me a number of years to gain mastery of that. I grieved about the loss of my professional career as a singer, but continued to perform as life gave me the opportunity. One of those experiences happened while I was in the in Rochester, and that was that I was hired as the soloist slash cantor at a reformed synagogue, uh, Temple Yisrael, 
in Rochester, New York. I did not know that. <laughs> and uh, I spent uh, three years uh, singing every Friday night service and uh, as a soloist singing all of the high holidays. And I developed a love for cantoral music at that time. Maybe and we can explain what a cantor is and what cantoral music is, if that's all right. It's a particular style of singing that belongs to the synagogue. It's uh, Eastern European in its origin. It's a uh, classical in its uh, sound, but it uh, it's very musical and it follows some traditions depending on the country that you come from. At any rate, the people go to school and they become uh, certified as cantors and I never was that. I just sort of picked it up by the seat of my pants. Mm -hmm. uh, sang in Hebrew, a transliteration, didn't know Hebrew, but sang the transliterations. Uh, even to the point where, while I was there, toward the end of my tenure time, the rabbi asked me to help prepare the little bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah girls and boys <laughs> for their uh, recitations in the church, in the, in the synagogue. Simultaneously, I was the minister of music at a Catholic church, so I would go to synagogue on Friday night, I'd go to early morning mass on Sunday morning, and then I'd return to my chapel and participate in my Latter-day Saint services. So <laughs> did you have a musical field. calling in the ward or? I did, I was the choir director in my <laughs> ward for part of that time. <laughs> Perfect. And I, I actually prepared a concert with my little Catholic choir and the Latter-day Saint choir and we shared a concert together. So it was, uh, a, it was a very expanding period of time for me. I did not know all that. I, I knew you were overqualified for this discussion, but I didn't know how overqualified you were. That's that's fantastic stuff. So I, after I returned to t uh, to Fort Worth, where I had my job at TCU, I start I continued to sing at the synagogue. Uh, so I've got about ten or twelve years of experience singing in the in the services at the synagogue, and they were they were really memorable times and times I really really enjoyed. Wow. So you've sung a psalm or two. I have. Yeah. Isn't that amazing, <laughs> Carrie? We've <laughs> talked a lot about my interest in Hebrew studies. I didn't know any of this, I don't think, and how this happened, uh, that this sort of connection. So when we came together to, as you know, we wrote a paper together, the psalm sung. And when we came together to write that, um, uh, it, it was sort of a fascinating bringing together of, of two different strands of focus, right? That's fantastic. Let me just add one other anecdote. And that was while I was at the synagogue in Rochester, it, on more than one occasion, I had my wife and my children come to the synagogue with me. Uh, I was not, of course, in the service itself. I was in a, uh, an ante room and my voice was piped in. But the children were, were introduced to the synagogue services while they were very small. Sean was two, three, four years of age during that period of time. Oh, and, fantastic. And they tolerated it uh, successfully because they knew that after service, there was an one Shabbat and there were treats. And I would, every week, I would fill my, my pockets with treats. We were too poor to have them. So I would rob the plate at the synagogue and come home and share them with my children. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so I've, I've had my children at a few uh, synagogue uh, services when they were, were young. And uh, yeah, you have they, they, they love it to begin with. But just like any like sacrament meeting, after a while, the younger ones are kind of kind of done and you, you have to work your way through that. But that's that's great. So interesting. I didn't know they would pipe your voice in the services. I've been the cantor was right there with us. But uh, that, was a, that was because it was a, a, a Jewish cantor. Agenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a Gentile. And so they didn't really feel comfortable with me being on the rostrum leading the service. And so <laughs> it was actually an A-frame building that was raised up. It was all glass, beautiful in the woods. And there was a basement. And I stood in the basement where I could see the, the rostrum above and uh, could come in when the time was right. Keep that goy out, out there. That's good. The, the Gentile, that's good. That's yeah. fun stuff. But it sounds like you had a great relationship with them and a great experience. That's just I did. Good fun. I did. Uh, well, so, so this is good. Could, could you guys also just tell us a little bit about this paper you referenced, Sean? Um, just I think our audience would be interested in the work that you've done on this because you're about to do some of it with all of us. You don't have to tell us like go through what the content of the paper sure. is, but just kind of the general idea. So uh, BYU uh, 
produces something called the Sperry Symposium each year, and it's Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon Doctrine and Covenant. So every four years, you have an Old Testament year, and we wrote a paper for the Old Testament year, um, and it was accepted. We presented uh, and then also wrote the paper. The paper was published. It's called The Psalm Sung, The Power of Music and Sacred Worship, and oh boy, I should have it here. I think it's from 2015, maybe uh anyway uh so yeah that we we sort of brought together probably 2017 because i think 2018 was the last old testament okay okay so yeah. then probably 2013 actually that oh, four okay. years earlier yeah. yeah okay um makes sense to me and so we you know we did the biblical and that was sort of my job and then you'll hear my dad talking about the musical historical components of how things how the psalms were sung over the centuries and we'll do a little bit of that today i think so that's fun all right well let's let's jump in uh sean would you be willing to just give us a little introduction to what the psalms are so absolutely if you're reading along in the old testament all of a sudden you get to this book proverbs also catches you by surprise this reads differently you've been reading historical books the prophetic books are, are somewhere on the horizon. And this is part of what is known in the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, uh, which is an acronym for Torah, Nevi'im, the prophets, and Ketuvim. This is in the Ketuvim, the writings. And it's a collection of prayers. It's a collection of songs that uh, was collected over time, uh, known as the Tehillim is its name in the Hebrew Bible. So this collection, then it, it doesn't progress in any kind of a historical way. Um, there is, it's sort of, many have seen a, a five-part division in it, which would then reflect the five books of Moses, right? Mm -hmm. And with a short little, what's called a doxology at the end of each of those sections, uh, doxology is a short little hymn of praise that brings it to conclusion. And then Psalm 150 is the end, and it has a cluding doxology for all of the Psalms. And so you can sort of see this, it's been brought together, it's been organized. Who wrote it is one of the questions that sometimes matters with the Psalms. A lot of the, there's a lot of superscriptions that say, well, this person wrote it. Those were basically added later and probably by, well, this sounds like David. We know David was a Psalmist from the scriptures, uh, talks about that in the historical books. And so, wow, this, this seems to fit his life. Um, and then you've got uh, a number of other names that uh, some of the Psalms are attributed to. And so biblical scholars will sort of debate when they should be dated. Uh, many of them do feel certainly David-like uh, to me yeah. As, yeah. as I read them. And they're, they're really beautiful. They're powerful. Uh, and, and they're like Nephi Psalm and 2 Nephi 4. You read these and you feel connected to the person who is writing them. They're just absolutely emotionally connected and powerful worship songs. Uh, I'm, I'm they're so I'm... heartfelt. So many of them, oh. so you can just feel their hearts and what their sorrows and what they're going through. And it's it's as touching kind of poetry or song as I've seen anywhere in the world. Yeah, we're going to um, we're going to look at Psalm 23 as one of the psalms we'll spend time in. But for most, if you want to have something that if, if you're suffering or you're mourning or you're struggling to have faith, going to the psalms. And I, I, I tell people the psalms can save your life. Find a psalm uh, as a bishop. I'm uh, when I've served as a bishop, what I call what many call a Nephi psalm and second Nephi four. You know, as people are sort of trying to find their way back to the Lord, I say, go read Nephi Psalm and tell me, share with me some thoughts. And it just, it helps the heart respond again and, and take faith again. Carrie, one more thing I could maybe mention before yeah. this sort of rapid introduction. There's a lot of different kinds of Psalms. Can I just read the different kinds? To yeah, I, I was hoping we'd do that. So that'd be great. Yeah. So you will recognize Psalms of Lament. Uh, or prayer. Psalm 22, which we'll probably spend a little bit of time with today, is a psalm of lament, and it starts, it's famous to Latter-day Saints and to Christians, because Jesus quotes the first line on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You can think of Nephi's psalm as the psalm of lament. I'm, I'm, oh, wretched man that I am, right? But then it moves, as does Nephi's psalm, by the way, in very beautiful biblical ways, from lament, there's this lament section where you connect 
and you 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 don't pretend everything's fine like sometimes we do. You say, yeah. "Here's here's what I'm mourning about," and then it moves into a plea section where you're pleading with the Lord, "Come help me, save me," and then a a triumphal section, which is expressing confidence that the Lord almost sometimes in past tense, the Lord has helped me, whether he actually has yet or not, there's this confidence that God will help. And you get this really beautiful, powerful three-part movement that you see actually in Nephi Psalm in really beautiful yeah. ways. So Psalms of lament, Psalms of praise, Psalms of thanksgiving, where you're just responding with joy, something that's happened. Uh, royal Psalms, are uh, sort of talk through experiences probably that the king has had and often then uh, are understood as also referring to jesus christ right because of mm -hmm. the christ as king yeah, I, I, I mean kings are uh, anointed so you get the, just kind of this messianic overtone about kings that christ uh, that the great messiah picks up and absorbs right so yeah beautifully said uh, Psalms, uh, songs of Zion that sort of extol the virtues of coming up to Zion, of being part of Zion. And then the last one I'll mention is liturgies. So pretty famous for many Latter-day Saints is Psalm 24, mm -hmm. who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Did I just quote that correctly? I hope you so. did. You did. Um, yeah. and, and many think this was actually recited as you're ascending, maybe even these temple steps up to the temple mount. And, and you're, you're preparing yourself emotionally and mentally, and maybe even you have what we would think of almost as a temple recommend, do I have clean hands and a pure heart? Uh, and so that kind of a liturgy where you're, you're preparing and you're worshiping as part of it. So, yeah, And a lot a of people think that the Levites sing many of these psalms, as you were in the temple, you could hear the Levites kind of chanting, singing um, these songs. Uh, and I'm, I'm convinced that that a number of them have to have been performed in some connection with the temple. And that makes sense to me. And in well, fact, just as a teaser for my audience, I, I'll, I'll do like what I call a shortcast, maybe a five to 10 minute thing, just on Psalms 24. It was something that was in my thesis, my master's thesis. And I'm just, uh, I'll spend some time on it, but anyway, love that. Uh, yes. Um, so, you know, to Carrie's point, you, you see it in the Bible, them singing at the temple when David brings the ark up to the temple, mm -hmm. you've got them singing. So if you look at First, Corinthians, First Chronicles 16, uh, sing unto the Lord, sing psalms unto him. That's uh, First Chronicles 16, 9. And then it's connected with temple worship. Seek yeah. the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. And then if you fast forward to a thing with Solomon in Second Chronicles 5, they're singing psalms and they're playing music and that united singing of the levites and uh, that united prayer we might say causes them to be prepared to for the lord's presence the cloud descends right the glory right, at, the, at the temple dedication right yeah right yeah right exactly there in second chronicles with the dedication it's carrie saying of uh, solomon's temple so yeah, the singing of psalms, very temple connected, very much connected to temple worship um, and seeking after the Lord, both repentance, thanksgiving, you, you bring a joyful heart to the temple, you bring a mourning heart to the temple, and you seek after the Lord there. And, and just imagine the Levites sort of standing on these temple stairs singing these beautiful songs, these renditions, these prayers as you ascend. And then that sort of then prepares for what my dad and I cared about, which is, you know, what, what does this look like? What, 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 because music connects for us. So, yeah. And maybe I'll just add in one other element that we've seen a couple of times by this point, because we've done the whole storyline by this point, uh, all the, those historical books uh, you've seen, for example, uh, Saul, well, uh, yeah, well, Saul does it with the, the sons of the prophets of the prophets, but also um, Samuel uh, talks about this and Elisha, for example, Elisha, uh, they, they want to know something from him. And so he starts uh, talking about uh, singing or chanting, but it's probably a psalm he's doing. And then the answer to prayer comes to him. Um, uh, we saw that also with Saul and, and Samuel. So this is a, a common thing. The sons of the prophets or this group of prophets seem to be doing that all the time. Uh, there, there's a real connection between the psalms and inviting the spirit into the lives of these people you, you see a number of times in the stories. 
you've got uh david playing for saul the way yeah. the scriptures describe it there's an evil spirit that rests upon saul and david will come and play and so a long history biblical history of david being musical right yeah. uh, my, by the way just one other fun connection my my parents gave me as a middle name the name of david so there's all kinds ah. of sort of fun things here but um yeah and and the evil spirit departs and to me that then gets at what we're talking about we read the psalms and we just are like okay what is going on here but you need to live the psalms right you need yeah. the psalms sung the psalms felt that that's sort of what we're talking about um maybe well, just take us there Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, let me just say one other thing, and then uh, I'll I'll stop blabbing on about about these things that I hope are of some interest. Um, this idea of the psalm of lament that has a three part progression, we don't know how that worked exactly in a temple setting, but if you think of maybe if it's connected with the possibility of being connected with animal sacrifice, and that the poignancy of the death of the animal in that lament yeah. section the plea section with the sprinkling or pouring out of the blood in, in sort of a request, and then the sacrifice, the smoke of the sacrifice ascending and it's triumphant, whether that's the way it played out or not, think of the beauty of how the music and the prayer connects with what you're actually physically doing. And then think of temple worship and the way we act out our beliefs and our deeply cherished uh, faith through ordinance, right? Um, yeah. and, and so you can sort of see temple worship connecting with what we do in the temple today. Well, and I, I think, I don't know, but it's my understanding that there was a time where uh, when they had longer endowment sessions where there was some singing that was part of, of the, the temple uh, service. But we keep uh, pairing that uh, endowment session down. But anyway, I could be wrong on that, but that's that's what me grandpappies have taught me. So. I've heard that as well. But if you think of what we do in the temple as musical in its own way, right? Yeah, so yeah. united kind of um, singing, uh, united prayer and yeah. seeking after the Lord with all of our hearts, with our bodies, with our souls. You could think of the whole thing as a song, even yeah. though we're not actually singing music. You know? yeah, agreed. Agreed. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. All right. Well, so uh, walk us through this uh, experience of uh, the, the psalm sung. Well, I'll jump in for a, and talk about that by saying that we don't really know what it was like because we don't have any recordings back in the, in the temple days. And they didn't and leave us uh, any musical notations either, did they? Well, they kind of left notations, but we don't know exactly what they mean. And I'll yeah. defer to Sean here for a second. And he has a... a, a a visual that he can put up in the description about that and then i'll come back in and uh, we'll actually hear some some recited hebrew from the first psalm uh, that is following the markings that are in the text sean yeah so i'm going to share my screen here i just sort of prepared a little example okay so i just wanted to show you really quickly uh you have in hebrew they don't use vowels, although in the Hebrew Bible, vowels have been added to help people read the Hebrew correctly. Or and the so Hebrew Bible the way we have it today. Let's... Yeah, yeah, exactly. But anciently, no vowels. And then you get what's what's known as the Masoretic text, where all those vowel markings have been added in. And let me show you first some of the, the Degashim, the vowel markings. Oops, those green markings. So that's uh, if you're reading right to left, that first circle is an E eh sound. Um, if you're the second one, which is sort of like this, a T marking is a kamatz, an A ah sound, or sometimes an O sound. So those are the vowel markings. But then what most people ignore, even as they're reading, learning to read Hebrew, are every single word, for the most part, has these cantillation markings that help you, you prolong some things, you sort of slur or connect with the following word, or there's a little bit of a break. Um, originally in the Babylonian markings where there's some some letters used it's probably okay this is a, a certain melody is used here so interpreting what's going on is the challenge but all of these markings end up being used for cantors or for uh, lectors those reading to read it with a certain melodic kind of a style so that's those are known as the te'amim or the cantillation marks we, we we're not going to 
teach you the test. I mean, that seems uh, like that might not be very helpful, but just to get a sense for what we're looking at, we thought that might be at least and, a little bit. And just for the, the uh, majority of our audience that are not seeing this, I'll just describe that both the vowels and the, the cantor marks are just little teeny figures underneath the, the letters. So they're smaller than the letters that you could fit one or two. You know, some of them look like colons or T's or uh, backward L's or wishbones, different things like that. They're just little teeny marks underneath that uh, if you study it, then you know, okay, this means this, this means that. So that, that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Thank you, Carrie. I forgot uh, most are listening, not uh, watching. And, and I would add, it's debated what exactly Jesus is referring to when he says every jot and tittle will be fulfilled. Some people think it's little sort of flourishes on the letters themselves, but, yeah. but uh, others would say, no, it's these markings themselves, you know, all, even the little dots that help you know how to read, you know, will all be fulfilled. So I'll stop sharing that. Good. Okay, so then I will, I will share my screen and we'll listen to, um, before it gets started, this is just a reading of the Psalm, Psalm 1. And I'm going to let it run for a couple of verses. It's about six verses long, but I want to let it run through at least through verse four, because in verse four, it seems as if the lector is actually singing a little bit. And, and so you'll hear it and maybe see it as well. Ashre haish, asher lo halach baatsat reshaim, uvder hataim lo amad, uv moshav letsim lo yashav. Ki im betorat adonai hefzo, uv torato yehege yomam valaila. Vehaya ke et shatul al palgemaim, asher pirio yiten berito, ve alehu lo yibol. וכל אשר יעשה יצליח. לא כן הרשעים, כי אם כמוץ אשר תדפנו רוח. אוקיי, אז אתם יכולים לראות איך זה עושה את האינטרפרטציה שלהם להגיע את הקנטלציה שלהם. אז זו הדרך שהדברים האלה הם מתאפשרים. אני חושב שהיה איזה אדם בשם מיטשל, דיוויד סי מיטשל, ב-2012, Uh, applied his understanding of music uh, and the cantillations there, and he he claims that he just simply didn't uh, make any changes, any adjustments to them, but applied um, Western music theory to it and actually had people sing the the tune, and it it actually came out really well. He's just sort of an outlier uh, because. Western music hadn't been invented in those days, and who would have thought that the the rules of music theory from uh, from Europe and from the United States could actually accurately interpret these markings in these ancient texts? Uh, he's sort of an outlier, and his his research came out in 2012, so it's fairly recent. We won't take much time to talk about that; just simply to acknowledge that. Um, there are some interpretations about that. So we don't really know what happened. Um, when the temple was destroyed, the, the Psalms which had been performed in the temple seemed to drop out of the services. And um, it wasn't until much later that they started to reemerge and that maybe that even it was the early Christian church that started the, the use of Psalms in worship services. But soon thereafter or there about the same time, they started to appear in the, the worship services. <clears throat> in the synagogue. In the, in the synagogue as well. Uh, so the earliest that we have, it comes from uh, Christian sources, and it is um, a, a kind of a plain song where this same sort of uh, semi-formulaic delivery would appear. You'd have formulas that the, the performers, that singers would sing and so on and so forth. These different formulas would be used to uh, sing those things. So now let me just call forward a little bit of that so you can get a feel for what that sounds like. This is a, a modern recording, of course, but music from the Middle Ages. <laughs> So 
So I would just want to add that these choristers or these priests that would perform would be uh, in the lofts of the cathedrals, out of sight, and the feeling was of this disembodied voice, this prayer that was uh, ascending to heaven, but also coming down from heaven. And the mood that was created in the listener was similar to what we felt as we heard it, a kind of a mystery uh, that was associated with that kind of singing that brings a whole new level of worship beyond what would be normally uh, spoken text. The next example that we're going to play is a little bit later. This is an uh, Alleluia Angelos Domini. It's a response. And it is a, the next sort of musical development was um, organum, where you have two voices that sort of run back and forth close in harmony and then drawing together in unison. You can hear it. And it's kind of mysterious. It's a very beautiful sound. Okay, so that creates a very interesting sound. It, um, it sort of has these two voices wandering in their own paths, sometimes in harmony, sometimes in unison. And I'm sure it wasn't intended for this metaphor, but I certainly see the metaphor of people that are wandering in their own paths, but still seeking that final result, seeking God. And always when these things come to the end, no matter where they've wandered, they end up on the same pitch. So the symbolism to me is, is pretty significant. It was a, a different kind of a sound, but more complex than what had been there before. Now we're gonna to listen to some, some polyphony. Um, and the, this is again, more musically uh, sophisticated than the other stuff that has been. Um, these voices wandering, but now they're starting to be more richly harmonic in our according to our ears, sometimes wandering separately, sometimes unified in a kind of what's called homophonic or where the words are really easily understood. At other times, the voice is entering at different times to obscure the text. Here's an example of that. <laughs> to say that's the kind of homophonic where it's sort of choral and the words are really easy to understand. <laughs> To this point, the music is always performed by somebody else. The, the worshipers are influenced by the sounds that they hear, but they're not active participants. And that, re that remained solidly so clear until the Reformation. I'm going to turn back over to Sean to talk a little bit about some of the changes that occurred in worship as we entered into the Reformation. Can you pick, pick that up, Sean? Yeah, so... I think this kind of music resonates with us, but it, it's not familiar uh, for most uh, listeners. We, as Latter-day Saints in our sacrament meeting uh, worship services, we're influenced by the music of the Protestant Reformation, where now there's this emphasis on not only are the priests or the, the leaders of the congregation going to create 
an atmosphere, but the congregation all participates in rejoicing and celebrating the word of God together. And then there's all kinds of modifications that happen to make that a little bit easier. So you start to get rhyming and meter. Uh, you, you're more comfortable. You notice this has all been in Latin. And now you're going to say, nope, they're going to say, we, we need to get this in the language that people understand. And so it's translated. And then once it's translated, you lose a little bit of the meaning of the original, or at least, you know, every translation shifts that a little bit. So then you can start tinkering with the words a little bit. Well, let, let's make these rhyme so that they're easier to understand. And the more it gets where everybody can understand it, then you can start to make it more and more complex so that you've got um, harmonies and you, you get some sort of verses with chorus that can be repeated over and over again. So you get all kinds of modifications that happen uh, once the Reformation hits. Am I, am I describing that uh, fairly well, Dad? Anything, what would you add? Yeah, that's right. I was actually, I have an example of this. One of the things that happens, you mentioned, and I'll just uh, reinforce, as soon as you start to versify things, as soon as you start to find rhyme schemes, the, the words have to change and they lose some of their original meaning and they're replaced by the privilege of everybody participating. Here is a recording of um, one of the psalteries from the 16th century, of course, in a modern recording. Here we go. that tradition more readily because uh, we learn to sing in our in our worship services we often learn to sing parts we learn to harmonize there's um, something wonderful um, and symbolic about being in harmony with one another and uh, but that's the tradition that we know most readily uh, I'm just going to take a moment and call up to on my this you won't see it but I'll, I'll have it available I'm just going to read the King James version of the 23rd Psalm. And you'll see that it's not versified. It's not, um, it, it, there's no rhyme scheme involved in it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Uh, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Those words are all familiar to us, but now I've drawn out of our hymn book uh, something that was had been carried forward, the Lord my pastor will prepare, which is a versification of the 23rd Psalm and the poetry Joseph Addison did this and his dates were 1672 to 1719. So this comes from that same sort of early Reformation period of time. Here's what these two verses sound like. The Lord my pasture will prepare and feed me with a shepherd's care. His presence will my want supply and guard me with his watchful eye. My noonday walks he will attend and all my silent midnight hours defend. Or in second, verse two, when in the sultry glebe I faint or on the thirsty mountain pant, to fertile vales and dewy meads, my weary wandering steps he leads. And where the peaceful rivers soft and slow amid the cooling verdant landscape flow. Now you can see just how radically departed that is from, from the, um, original text, the meaning of the original text. So the, the evolution of this continues to go on. Um, Sean and I did a little research, we carried it on. It's out of actually moved beyond uh, the religious use into sectarian music. And there's a whole number of people who have taken 
this 23rd Psalm and have made musical numbers of it. We're not going to do that because in our presentations before when we did, the people who were listening were so shocked by the sacrilege of what they heard that it was, and we don't want to do that today. That's not our purpose here today. Uh, although I'm a little bit tempted. Uh, uh, it, it, it does, we, 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 we say, okay, well, that's, uh, that's, muse, that's a hymn that's sacred to us or a psalm that's sacred to us, and that sound is not sacred to us. But uh, I don't know, if you, if you guys want, maybe we do just a little teeny bit, I don't know, uh, and just tell our readers, brace themselves, but it's up to you. Yeah, so here, here's some of them. Kanye West, Jesus Walks, Coolio, uh, Gangsta Paradise, Good Charlotte, uh, Notorious B.I.G. and Puff Daddy. Hey, Dad, yeah. I think your paper is covering the microphone a little bit. Oh, all right. Sorry. Thanks for catching that. Uh, just Alice in Chains, um, uh, U2, Love Re Rescues Me, Pink Floyd, The Grateful Dead, and Megadeth, <laughs> Shadows of Death, and Peter Tosh, Yah Guide. So these are all renditions of the 23rd Psalm that have made their way into um, common usage. So, so I had me, no idea Pink Floyd <laughs> did. Uh, <laughs> did uh, Psalms 23, and, and I didn't know about Megadeth, though you guys told me, but that, uh, that they'd done it. Anyway, that's interesting stuff. Hmm. Let, let yeah, me say so, a word about that, uh, Dad. The, it just shows how powerful the Psalms have been. And, and the one we played uh, was Megadeth, um, uh, Shadow of Death, D-E-T-H. And it sounds, for most Latter-day Saints, some of you, some listeners, you may be heavy metal souls, I don't know, but for most Latter-day Saints, you're like, no, this is not how this is supposed to sound. They're, it's This is sacrilegious. But if you research Megadeth, they, uh, most of the members of the band have been or are uh, Christians. And they, this is meaningful to them. And so you get sort of they're walking through the shadow, uh, the valley of the shadow of death. And they're the heavy metal music is portraying that, but then the sounding of the bells, the hope that God will will comfort me. It's it's actually pretty powerful, but it is grating for those of us who are not used to the style of music. It is grating for me, but it was interesting to listen to. And the, the metaphor, I, I was seeing if I could pull it up. I should have had it pulled up before, but I was hesitant. And I can't get it so that we can listen to it today. But uh, it, the music is really harsh, and the recitation of the 23rd Psalm is done with a gravelly, a sinister da, voice. Da, da. It's kind of yeah, like, like that. that. Yeah, yeah, and, more like that, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That kind of a sound, and it's so grating. But in the midst of that, if you understand the musical symbolism, what they have done is created that valley of death. Uh, and the darkness of that circumstance. And in the midst of that, there's a single crystalline bell that continues to chime all the way through there as if leading a person through the valley of shadow of death. So the symbolism is possible, but it's certainly grating on the nerves <laughs> to hear it. Yeah, so, uh, so that's uh, sort of the, the evolution of our history uh, as it started uh, through the Christian circles. And uh, similar things in the in the Hebrew, there are composers that have written both choral numbers and solo numbers to be sung in the synagogue as well. I don't have examples of those. I just wanted to share those. Yeah. With you. So that's great. That's kind of I've sort of run out of steam of things that I wanted to present. How about you, Sean? Well, Carrie, if it's OK, I'd like to take a moment and just talk about us in our Latter-day Saint context for a moment, mm -hmm. just how powerful and important music continues to be. And I just, you may not have thought about our sacrament meetings in this way. We, we try to dress a little bit differently to show we're entering sacred time on the Sabbath as we, we come to worship. And we arrive and often it's noisy and we're just our regular patterns. It's Sunday, but we're just, they were seeing everybody. We're excited to see them. And then something happens to mark the beginning of sacred time. And it's an opening hymn. Uh, we sing together. We unite together. And I don't know if you've ever thought of it in these terms, but you, if you think of that song as a prayer, you're saying exactly the same words as the 12 year old or as the 75 year old is the man or the woman with whatever political you know leanings they have compared to your political leanings and we we set it all aside and we worship together and music helps us do that with the idea that 
the choirs of heaven are joining in. Heaven unites with earth. We unite with one heart and one mind, and we demarcate sacred space and time. And it begins. And then another fascinating thing happens because we sing again at the, when it's time to elevate. So you may say we've gone from what you might call profane time or secular time to sacred time to a holy place. And then there's this moment we ascend again and demarcate a holier, higher realm. And the music is a little bit more meditative as we sing the sacrament hymn and prepare for the ordinance of the sacrament and seek to enter, you might say, into the presence of the Lord as a community, this deeply sacred moment that is the center of our worship service is demarcated and we're prepared for it by united prayer before the Lord. And if you think of Solomon's temple, the veil of Solomon's temple, you know, and symbolically God it, it is on the other side of that veil, you know, seated upon the, the throne, symbolically speaking, the, the uh, ark. Oh. Um, then, and you think of the veil, or sorry, the, the sacrament tablecloth is a little bit of a veil that is removed as we seek uh, to become one with the Lord through that sacred ordinance, there's some really powerful symbolism and imagery there that's meaningful to us. And, and remember that that Ark is the Ark of the Covenant, right? And what we're doing there is renewing the covenant. So I think there's some, some intentional uh, symbolism there, but oh, keep, keep going. That, that's, that's so beautifully said. Uh, Carrie, you know, you've worked a little bit on the importance of covenants. Uh, <laughs> a little bit around that, yeah. And, and then we do it at the end of sacrament meeting, of course, we sort of demarcate it again uh, as we sort of leave that very sacred worship time. And, and I would add uh, this idea of ordinances seeking to enter into the presence of God. You get it with baptism as well, right? As you mm -hmm. sort of, if you think of the waters as a veil and, and on the other side, we are offered the gift of the Holy Ghost, the presence of God. Um, on the other side of that, this, this and, and there's there's this ordinance that's this prayer. Anyway, the the, sa the sanctity of singing, the sanctity of the psalms, the power of psalms to unite us with each other, but also more importantly, maybe our hearts with the Lord, uh, I think is meaningful. And I would hope as we study the psalms, some of that will will help it be more meaningful to us. That's fantastic, and and the psalms really. I, I hope um, that they are a worshipful experience as you read them. It's it's good to read them kind of trying to tease out the meaning and, and that kind of thing. And I, I, of course, enjoy doing that. But I think it's important that we also have a worshipful uh, experience as we read them because that's what they were intended for. Well, that's beautiful and wonderful stuff. And I, I hope that uh, it helps us uh, get a sense for the Psalms overall and, and Psalms 23 in particular right now. Uh, maybe let's just spend a couple of moments on a particular Psalm. Uh, I think, Sean, you had a, a psalm you were going to walk us through a little bit, and I can share screen to get the scriptural text up there if we'd like. That'd be great. Yeah, Psalm 22 is maybe one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, prophetic pieces or psalms or prophecies of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ certainly understood that way by the New Testament authors. It, it's sort of fascinating. If you look at Isaiah 53, as Latter-day Saints, we're most familiar with it because uh, Abinadi helps us with it in the Book of Mormon, right? And so yeah. we love, uh, I love, and, and really inspired by Isaiah 53. But I think we should put side by side with it Psalm 22 which is actually, uh, I, I can't remember the count, but I think Isaiah 53 in what we call the Passion Narratives, which is the end of Christ's life, uh, the atonement uh, in Gethsemane and on the cross, it's referred to, I think, 10 times Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, 11 times, or it might be nine and 10, something like that. They, they sort of stand together as these twin pillars of Old Testament prophecy about Jesus Christ. And this is a powerful one, Psalm 22 is. And maybe I'll just add, uh, because I'm just a stinker about this, but uh, I think uh, it says a Psalm of David. We don't know for sure, but it sure seems like it fits David's life. But whoever it is, whether it's David or not, there is someone who writes this and, and they're experiencing this themselves at the time. But what they're experiencing is a prefiguring of Christ. 
And I think it's worth looking at it for both because while I absolutely love and think the most important part is the prefiguring of Christ, if I'm going to apply it to my life, I need to put, I, I can do that better by putting myself in the position of that other person and say, are there times where I have felt this way? And so uh, I think it's worth it for our audience when they study the Psalm to think of both of those contexts. Thank you. In fact, as we know, the would the understanding uh, of the listeners, the original listeners, have been very clear about Jesus Christ or not? It's hard to know what they would have understood, but this would have had meaning in their lives. They suffered. Whoever wrote this was suffering in these ways and in ways that prefigure Christ. So that, that's really helpful, Carrie. Thank you. Yeah. So if you look, the very first verse, well, first, let me say this. This is one of those Psalms of Lament that has this three, this movement from lament in verses 1 through 19, 1 through 18. And then, yeah, where he's talking about his challenges in ways that are very powerful, that, that uh, really connect emotionally. And then verses 19 through 21, notice the plea, uh, be not far from me, deliver my soul, save me. And then it moves into this final portion, which is triumphant. Now, the fascinating thing here is look at verse one. So those are the three moments and maybe they connect. Uh, we've suggested they could connect with uh, animal sacrifices being done in the temple. We don't know for sure, but look at verse one, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that obviously is important to Christians because Christ says it from the cross. Well, he's expressing real emotions that then can help us know that Christ understands us when we feel alone. The original author has having these moments, Joseph Smith, of course, in Doctrine and Covenants 121, uh, where art thou? He says to God, these are feelings that, that we have, right? And to have Christ express them is powerful and helpful for us. And it's important to recognize he's quoting the first line of an actual entire song that ends triumphantly. If I were to say, come, come ye saints, I mean, you would understand come, come ye saints, but your brains, the Latter-day Saint brain is going to think of the entire message of the hymn. And he is almost certainly communicating to his listeners, it looks like everything has failed, but this ends well. This is part of the plan as he quotes this psalm from the cross. It, it's a very hopeful message, actually, even as he connects with us in our, at times, feelings of forsakenness, right? Yeah. So I think that's beautiful to recognize. But then if you track your way through this psalm, you just notice the language that's going to become very important uh, to Christian readers throughout you. We could go, uh, I, I'm skipping a number of things, but if you look at, for example, verse 14 and think of Christ's side being stabbed by the spear, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint and think of Christ stretched on the cross my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. He's thirsty. And then you have Christ talking about his thirst, fulfilling this, right? And, and pointing to this uh, through his experience on the cross. Look at verse 16. This is an important one. For dogs have compassed me, and dogs, kalavim, is often a reference to Gentiles uh, in, in Israelite literature and Jewish literature. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. And then this very powerful phrase, they pierced my hands and my feet. And this is what first led me to Psalm 22, because this is actually from the Greek Septuagint you get, they pierced. The Hebrew in the Masoretic text has something different. And it's the difference of a yod or a vav. They have something like, like a lion there at my hands and my feet. It doesn't make great sense. And then the Greek translation gives what would be in Hebrew, ka'aru, they pierce. And so you think, well, what's going on here? This got to the point where in medieval times, Jewish, uh, so a Jewish person who was going to decide what Bible to buy would go to this verse and say, wait, this says they pierce. Nope, that's a Christian Bible. Okay, this says... Uh, something different. 
I can buy this Bible. That's how important this verse was at times in the translation, sort of the history of this verse. Well, Dead Sea Scrolls has a fragment in the Hal Hever is where it was found, Ka'aru, that uh, supports that Greek Septuagint translation of they pierced, which is is fascinating, I think. And that, that Dead Sea Scrolls version is the oldest version we have. So that, that suggests that that is a, a very early and uh, a correct. So it makes you wonder when was the the other one changed. And yeah. There's all sorts of intrigue in there we won't go on to, but anyway. It's fascinating. And, and the Yod and the Vav, those are very easy mistakes to make. Yep. And you could see how th this would happen. You could also see how it becomes very important theologically to the people who are, who are doing the translation, right? Uh, yeah. Is it the Yod or the Vav? Yeah, thank you, Carrie. So uh, they pierce my hands and my feet. That's a powerfully Christ-centered Christ image, of course. Uh, verse 17, I may tell all my bones, this idea of being stretched out, right? And, and the being famished uh, and uh, very thirsty, right? And then they they actually, verse 18 is actually referred to in every single one of the four gospels. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. That is directly tied to uh, the gospels point back to it. John actually points back to it in two ways saying, you know, they're gonna divide his clothing, but then there's this cloak that they can't divide, and so they cast lots for that yeah. that cloak or that robe. Uh, you know, I skipped one that we should probably go look at because the New Testament, the Greek of the New Testament, points over and over again to the Septuagint rendering and connects with those verses. Look, skip back to verse seven, and and let's even go to the second mm -hmm. half of verse six. Carrie, if you would highlight that. Um, I'm a worm and no man, approach of men and despised of the people. And then this in verse seven, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. You can just hear what the gospel authors are, are hearing, right? As they, as they weave that into their account. Well, one last thing maybe that I should mention and that I think is fascinating to us as Latter-day Saints, Carrie, so you can see how, why this has been so important to Christians. We as Latter-day Saints have an additional reason to feel connected to it. And that's because if you look at the very last section, starting in verse 22, if you are thinking of Christ's experience that he's pleaded for help and now he Think of this time when he now descends into the spirit world, and Second Peter refers to this, and Joseph uh, F. Smith is going to study those verses, and it prepares him for the revelation that's contained in Doctrine and Covenants 138, where Christ enters into the congregation in the spirit world who is waiting to hear his triumphant message that death has been conquered, and look at how that ties beautifully with the end of Psalm 22, this triumphant portion of Psalm 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation, the assembly, as Doctrine and Covenants 138 has it. Will I praise thee? Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. At, uh, verse 24, he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. When he cried unto him, he heard, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. And then look at verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. And you have, there's one last little word I want to point out here before I conclude. Look at verse 30. A seed shall serve him. And I those of you who can hear the echoes or connections with Isaiah 53, and then what Abinadi talks about with, he sees the, the one who's cut off from the land of the living shall see his seed. Look at just how beautifully Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, the Gospels, Doctrine and Covenants 138, and for Latter-day Saints, it becomes this, this overwhelming message of Christ's atoning work in mortality, in post-mortality, in the spirit world, as we understand it from Doctrine and Covenants 138, and then, of course, triumphantly as he ascends into heaven, and that message goes forth to the entire world, as Psalm 22 seems to indicate here. It's just 
is spectacular. Uh, and, and we haven't maybe appreciated it quite enough as Latter-day Saints. I so agree. And I'll even throw in here, I mean, uh, Abinadi keeps asking about uh, who shall see his generation when he talks also about his seed. And we've got that there in that verse as well about accounted to the Lord for a generation. So uh, nice. it is beautiful yes. stuff. It's Carry also... I mentioned seed, but yeah, I think I, every time I talk about this, I miss generation. So I'm going to have to take, you know, that from you and make sure I, I, that we see that yeah, about so the generation. It's not too late to repent. Um, <laughs> True. It's, uh, th there's another fun thing that I've seen argued, and I, I can't remember the argument perfectly to go through it perfectly now, but it's been argued that, uh, that what happens in the story in, in say, Matthew and in the, the Gospels is kind of going backwards through part of the psalm. So you get like in verse 18, the garments potted, uh, parted, and then the bones stretched, and the the then the piercing of the hands and feet, and then he's thirsty, and and uh, the one that's kind of out of order is verse 14 with the the water and the bones. But uh, and then the people making fun of him, so on. You work your way all the way up to when he says, "My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me?" And that it's uh, the story in the Gospels kind of reverses the order of what's. Uh, in here, but that it's certainly laid out as an intentional parallel. And as you said, there's no doubt that the gospel writers are uh, are tying in those events to Psalm 22. It's very, very meaningful for them and uh, and should be for us. And, and I love the way you've tied it in with uh, Isaiah 53, just uh, so powerful. And yet it works for us in our own lives, right? There are times where I'm asking, God, where are you? I, I'm doing what you asked me to do, and there's some suffering going on here. And so uh, that triumphal ending uh, can be significant for all of us. So, well, thank you, both of you, so much. I hope this helps uh, people understand both Psalm 23 and 22 better, but also just the Psalms in general and have a more significant experience with them. We'll continue uh, during these weeks that we talk about the Psalms to kind of look at the meaning and talk about how to, to make it a worshipful experience, but I can't think of a better beginning uh, than this to make it so that we enjoy the Psalms, we pull meaning out of them, and uh, we, we, help, we allow them to help us worship the Lord and, and find meaning in our relationship with Him. And uh, what, what more could we hope for than that? So thank you both. You're welcome. But it's real pleasure. Fun, fun to be with you, Carrie. So fun to be able to do this with my father, right? Uh, thank you for yeah. inviting both of us. It, when, when you sit, gave us the invitation, we thought, oh, yeah, let's, let's do this. We like spending time together. We never get to, uh, so we, we'll get to hang out together for a few minutes. At least That's virtually, right. huh? Yeah. We brought our family back together again. Thank well, you. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Now, uh, uh, it, we may cut this part out. I don't know. I, I, was there going to be a request for a song somewhere in here? Oh, hey, <laughs> Dad, let's, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll sing a song for you. All right. We've spent time on Psalm 23, so I've got a, a, a piece of music that sort of harks back to the non-versified, non-metric, modal kind of things. It's a comp composition by Rayfon Williams, an English composer. Uh, he wrote uh, an opera based upon the Pilgrim's Progress. And um, as a young man, I was fortunate enough to perform the role of the Pilgrim in the American premiere, premiere which was done at BYU. So from that opera comes this rendition of the 23rd Psalm. <clears throat> The Lord is my shepherd, therefore can I lack nothing. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness.
grace and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There is no better ending than that. Yeah, we're, we're going to clap here. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for allowing me to do that. That's a real pleasure. Well, thank you uh, for edifying us, uh, uh, both uh, your son and myself and uh, the audience. Uh, what a treat this has been for us today to get the Psalms going and to uh, get the Psalms in our, our heart a little bit. Uh, all of it did that, but I, I think that ending especially did it for me. Yeah. So thank you both so very, very much. And uh, I, I thank you. And I guess I should always add uh, to our audience, if there's someone who you think this would help them understand the Psalms, uh, in, in a different way or help them have a good experience during this part. Uh, we actually spent a bit of time in the Psalms for uh, Come Follow Me. Uh, so pass this along and, and uh, let's help as many people have a great experience with it as possible.